thank you for joining us for this session and navigating the pre-award proposal development process. Um, just as um, a formal introduction. So my name is Angela So, um, and I am the program manager and hub administrator in the Center for Clinical and Translational Science, um, in which I oversee the network capacity program along with another program. Um, the network capacity program is a program that provides proposal development um, and implementation support for multi-center investigator initiated clinical research trials. And joining me today is Dr. Dar Dr. Darwin Conwell. You can go ahead and introduce yourself, please. I am Darwin Conwell. I'm a director of uh, gastroenterology, uh, hepatology, and nutrition. I'm the uh, program director for um, the program. And I'm working with Angela, and we're just excited to bring you these um, uh, UO1 uh, workshops. Thank you. And Dr. Jackson is the principal investigator for uh, the CCTS. And so just to kick things off, we'll go over just some brief housekeeping roles that one, this session is being recorded um, and will be uploaded to the CCTS website um, within one week. Uh, you can please feel free to use the Q&A feature uh, to submit questions at any time during today's session. Um, and you can also enable um, closed captioning the bottom of your screen. So I'm gonna go ahead, move forward uh, to with introduction of the panelists today. Joining us, we have Dr. Conwell, um, Dr. Lauren Wold and Diana Burdett. I'm going to, sorry, I know, um, Diana, would you like to go ahead and, and do a brief introduction? I'm trying to make sure Dr. Wold is, Join us. Oh, let's see. Sure. Um, I'm a senior grants and contract specialist with the grants management office um, in the College of Medicine. So I work with the PIs to help get the proposals proposals completed and submitted. Thank you, Diana. And Dr. Wold, would you like to give a brief introduction? Sure. It, it says that my video is disabled by the host. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can fix that. Yeah, mine mine says the same thing. Okay. Yeah, and I apologize. Which I'm okay with, but <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Dr. Conwell looks so professional and and go ahead. Okay. So I'll introduce myself in the interest of time. Um, my name is Lauren Wold. I'm a professor in the colleges of nursing and medicine also serve as the Associate Dean for Research Operations and Compliance in the College of Medicine. And I am not sure if we mentioned this, but I, I have a UO1 on um, World Trade Center health effects that I'm happy to talk about. Great, thank you. And so I believe we're just gonna walk through just some introductory um, uh, topics and questions so that way everyone um, understands uh, what the U01 concept. And I think Dr. Conwell, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you to just walk through. Sure, we're gonna just uh, have this um, just open discussion here with, uh, with the panelists and uh, have them just feel free to comment. So one of the big questions is what's the difference between an R01 and a U01? And R01, which most of us traditionally are aware of is um, one center or low risk uh, clinical research study conducted at um, um, it can be conducted in more than one uh, center. It's usually a very focused uh, project. Uh, and a, a UO one is a cooperative uh, agreement, um, a support mechanism that the NIH frequently uses for a high priority um, research area that requires the uh, involvement of the NIH staff um, and that is higher than for a typical uh, research project as an R grant. Um, Dr. Uh, Wald, um, any, any comments you want to make um, in regard to the uh, R01, uh, U01 uh, mechanism? And also, uh, Diana, feel free to, uh, to comment also. Sure. Thanks, Dr. So the way I see it is an R01, and I'll talk more about this with mine, but um, it could be a basic or clinical project. And mine is a basic project. I'm a basic scientist. Um, the way I see it is an R01 is, is a focused one center, one or two labs, but focused on a specific question with very limited, if, if not no involvement from the program officer and the folks that are funding. 
Whereas the UA one is a, a larger, usually multi-site, but also um, it's a, I'm just gonna work to turn my camera on, so I'm doing that. Um, and it's also, a, there's a lot of involvement usually from the NIH staff where they have a specific reason for funding this project and a specific um, involvement in the uh, execution of the project. Right, right. And um, yeah, that's, um, we'll, get, we'll do more uh, talking about this a little bit later. Let's go to the next slide, um, Angela. So one question is, do you need a U34 or you submit a U01. So let me explain what a U34. So the U34 is really a, a, a planning grant. It's usually one to two years. It's a planning grant that allows you to um, organize your thoughts, organize um, the U01, uh, assemble uh, a team of collaborative institutions, collaborative investigators around your theme uh, or the concept and then research uh, ideas that you want uh, to study. And the NIH actually does help you with um, the U34. So you have an idea that, uh, or a concept or a disease that you want to study. Um, in, our, in our particular department right now, one of our um, um, uh, professors we re recently recruited from um, University of Wisconsin, Dr. Venkatesan is an international expert on cyclic uh, vomiting syndrome. So she's very interested in putting together a U01 collaborative grant on uh, cyclic vomiting uh, syndrome. So there's no announcement right now for a for a, uh, an RFA for a U01 on cyclic vomiting syndrome. So she'll need to put together a U34 uh, planning grant with collaborators across uh, the country. Uh, and, and if that, that's awarded, the NIH will help her plan and put together uh, an application for a U01. So that's what that is about. Once the U34 is put together, then you apply for a U01 a grant with your team, which is a five-year uh, five grant. Next uh, slide. So what role does NIH play in the U01 grant mechanism? Well, in this cooperative agreement, the project director or the principal investigators retain the primary responsibility and dominant role for directing and executing the proposed multi-center clinical study with the NIH staff being substantially involved as a partner with the principal uh, investigator. And this is critical. I mean, it's really um, fun to have the NIH with you in partnership with you as you uh, go through um, uh, putting together the proposal um, and putting together the research plan once you're awarded the grant um, and actually organizing your thoughts around the theme and uh, your hypotheses and actually uh, tackling the question at hand. And it's very important to the NIH that um, uh, that the questions are answered and the research is successful because they, this is actually usually an announcement uh, or a, a topic that's very, very important to the NIH as a public health concern um, that they're interested in. So they want you to be successful. Um, they're very engaged uh, with you and they provide uh, scientific input um, with this. So it's, uh, it's not a typical R01 where you're awarded the grant and you go off and do your thing. This is they're involved with you uh, locking arms and arms with you to help you uh, be successful uh, with your um, with your investigations. Comments, um, Dr. Wall? No, I think you covered it uh, very well. I, you know, just to reiterate this, it's very important to not only get the blessing of the program director or the uh, program officer and, the, and the, the staff, but also to incorporate their um, their comments because they will give you quite pointed comments of what needs to be there and what should not be there. Right, right. So, so what should I do if I want to submit a U01 cooperative uh, agreement? So there may be an RFA request for applications in my um, in both of my U01s that I'm part of. There was a request for applications. The one called the Chronic Pancreatitis um, Diabetes and Pancreas Cancer Consortium, called the CPDPC. The NIDDK was very interested in the um, crosstalk, uh, if you will, between chronic pancreatitis, diabetes, and pancreas cancer. Diabetes, of course, is a huge public health issue, and it um, it actually um, you know interacts with chronic pancreatitis and pancreas cancer. So they really wanted investigations in this space, and so 
there was an RFA put out for academic medical centers to uh, submit applications to uh, organize uh, a cooperative uh, U01 uh, agreement. So we applied for that and were awarded uh, that. The second one was, uh, was acute pancreatitis. Uh, and this was also uh, from the NIDBK that was also involving diabetes. So again, diabetes is um, very, very important. And so um, some patients with pancreatitis after um, um, get diabetes after acute pancreatitis. And so we uh, applied and was awarded that one. So um, these cooperative agreements are, um, are um, alliances. So you're now working with other academic medical centers to uh, accomplish the same, same uh, goal. And so you should contact your program officer at least 12 weeks before the submission deadlines. The submission deadlines are listed on the NIH website, just like the R01 deadlines, your R21 deadlines, and the other uh, grant uh, mechanism deadlines. One thing I'll point out here. Yeah, right ahead. Um, right ahead. Yes, <clears throat> there are additional sections of the grant where you specifically deal with the questions of the cooperative agreement and how this project as a U01 is different really than a, than a single or a multi-PI type of an R01. So there are sections in the grant where you actually talk about them. Yeah, so there are some um, comments in the chat. Angela, can you see some of those? If you can read some of those, why don't we, why don't we read some of those? Um, and answer some of those while we're here. Sure, so I see, um, so would the program officer be the first point of contact when there is no RFA for CVS? Would that be the best approach? I would say yes, I presume CVS, you mean cardiovascular sciences? I'm not um, that's that's going to be cyclic vomiting syndrome. That's Dr. Uh, oh. Dickinson from the GI division. I asked who I was going to. Yeah, cyclic vomiting syndrome. Yes, that would be the uh, the best approach because they're going to be able to give you some idea of the importance of that uh, to the. In this case, it would be the NIDDK, um, and you're going to need to present to them your case. So what I would do is put together uh, a specific aims page and also have a list of um, academic medical centers that are interested joining with you in cyclic vomiting syndrome and um, make an arrangement for a, um, a meeting for an hour with the program um, officer um, and have some a few of your um, academic medical centers with you where you frame the question, um, frame the problem in uh, an AIMS page. Um, telling them what your hypotheses are, what questions you want to answer. I think they also like to have, like you to have a bio repository uh, with a lot of these because it's nice to, with the NIDDK and a lot of these, um, a lot of the institutes like is to have a bio repository where at least um, in our case, like 30% of the samples go to a central repository. And that actually helps the scientific community because you can envision now that the whole scientific community can now have um, access to samples from, in this case, it'd be a cyclic vomiting syndrome, uh, well-characterized phenotyped cyclic vomiting syndrome patients um, for the scientific community to use. So, that, so the money is spent wisely and now we have uh, samples that can be used for the greater scientific community uh, to use and study. So, so that's, um, that's what I would uh, suggest. There's another question. Yes, uh, Dr. Jones asks, for clinical trial U01 pre-planning for NIAID, we use the R34 planning grant process. How is this different from the U34 or are they basically similar? I'm not familiar with the R34. I would have to look it up. Usually I have to type it in Google and, and get the answer. But if it is a planning grant and you planned out your hypothesis and um, you know you, you planned out your aims. You would just need to meet with the program official and speak with them, and, and that may be enough for your U01. But I, I'm not familiar with it. But it sounds it sounds like it may be um, it, may, it may be a similar uh, process. Maybe I can jump in here quick. Yeah, Carolyn, it's uh, good to see you on here. 
Um, I think the R34 is more geared towards a planning for an R01 or a multi PI R01, as opposed to the U34 a planning for the U01. Um, but I can check into that and get back with you. Okay, very good. Yes, and in follow up, uh, Dr. Jones has said in this, we had to plan out all the planning documents for multi center clinical trial mm -hmm. okay. plans within plans. Okay. Um, another question that came up um, I am planning on a, a multi center clinical trial, but do not have a U34 as of yet and need to get that first. Mm -hmm. Are you going to discuss U34 at this seminar or going to do later, uh, later in the series? Mm -hmm. We we hadn't planned on discussing U34. I think that's a that's a just a, that's a contact the uh, program officer um, uh, to get information on that. Um, but we hadn't planned on discussing the U34. It is a planning uh, grant, um, but we hadn't we hadn't planned on discussing that. No. Okay, I think that's all of the questions for right now. I'm gonna. I think we have this is our last slide with questions. Okay. How far in advance should I contact the PO? Yeah, 12 weeks. Um, so Dr. Uh, Jose Serrano from the NIDDK uh, gave us a great lecture uh, and that's been recorded um, also. And um, he recommended uh, 12 weeks at least, but as soon as, soon as you can is, is really a, a, as possible is the answer. And who should I contact uh, prior to consultation? Uh, the appropriate uh, program director for the subject matter of the uh, application, yes. What information should be included in a letter requesting consultation about applying for a U01 multi center high risk cooperative agreement? So, the details in your letter may vary depending on the type of study, with the epidemiology trial, drug trial, behavior intervention. Generally, letters should include the following data proposal submission, study title, study PI, and other key investigators, primary institution, the aim, significance, the summary of the study. Summary of safety risk issues, proposed start date, proposed sample size, general statistical assumptions, confirmed collaborating sites, discussion of uh, product intervention, detailed budget, evidence of the U34 planning uh, components have been uh, completed. I think for your very first contact, you may not need um, all of this. I think sometimes the first um, contact is an email uh, with them, uh, with an AIMS page. And um, what, I've, what I've often done is had um, a brief PowerPoint presentation just to kind of plant the seed um, uh, with them. Then sometimes they can direct you to the appropriate um, um, area. There's, there's sometimes they can have, uh, direct you to appropriate um, uh, actually study sections in different areas of, of topics of where your uh, idea or concept may fit. Uh, so that, that's also a nice thing to think about. Um, you just make a point of contact and just present and pitch your um, your ideas, and they can uh, direct you to the right. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it's, it's a different uh, program uh, officer. Dr. Wald, any other comments? No, I think um, there's always uh, they say three months or twelve weeks, but it's totally fine to, to even contact them sooner. Yeah. Um, Definitely sooner the better, and they will help you with the formulation of, of the grant. Yeah. It takes a long time to write a grant. Um, yeah, I think three, you know, three months. It, it, it takes me longer. Um, I remember my first uh, first grant. It takes a long time. A lot of revisions, reworking, rewriting. It takes a long time to put all this stuff together, especially your very first one. And after you've done it a couple times. Um, it, it comes together um, much easier when you work with someone like um, Diana uh, Burdett, who's on, or Amanda Gibbs in the grants uh, management office. Once you start um, assembling this, they can help you because they have some already have some um, information from other grants that you've submitted or others have, that have submitted. So it helps you with layers of support, and they've got some templates for parts of the grant that makes things much easier. So you can just focus on the science uh, of, of getting of getting the science down. We have another question. Uh, Dr. Moss asks, any advice on approaching a specific UG3, UH3 call? 
Yeah, I'm not familiar with the UG3, UH3 call. Dr. Wald, are you? I am not. Um, UG3, UH3 call, I'm not familiar with that. And Karen, not, Karen yeah. feel free to email me and I can look into that um, specifically for you if you'd like. Yes, yes. We have to get back with you with more information on that. UG3, UH3, I don't, I don't know. Okay. Move on and I invite uh, Dr. Wold to kind of elaborate a little bit more on your, your one grant. Great. So once again, as I mentioned, mine is a basic science UA one. Um, this is part of the World Trade Center Health Effects Institute, and it's funded by the CDC as well as NIOSH, uh, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. And what's interesting about this UL1, so this was actually a one-year UL1 where, and we've now reapplied for, uh, applied for a renewal into a five-year. Um, the World Trade Center monies are, um, are renewed every five years. And the CDC gives uh, 30, has a budget of 30 million per year just for World Trade Center health effects related projects. Um, and every year within that five year window, they offer these, but they're shortened by a year. We ended up applying for our first one um, when it was only one year and then now have renewed to a five year. Um, the overview is uh, my colleague and um, uh, co-PI on the grant who's at NYU, uh, Mitch Cohen, he actually collected dust from when the World Trade Center fell on September 12th and 13th of 2001. And he is actually the only one in the world who has the specific um, dust that was collected when the towers fell. And so um, we were actually encouraged to apply by the CDC and program uh, officer. And um, I would say they were engaged, but not engaged. They were just very excited about the collaboration because my background is cardiovascular physiology and we branched into this um, connection between the brain and the heart. And they that was really a direction they were interested in because of the greater incidence of neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative, I can't speak, it's Friday, I guess, um, disease in the responders the first responders from the, the collapse of the towers. And so they were very excited about that and had asked us to strongly um, look into this funding mechanism. Um, you know, as we mentioned before, the, the budgets for these are usually a lot bigger than a standard RL1. Um, the U01 that I have, the, the budget was a max of 600,000 direct per year. Uh, as I said, it was just a one year and we've reapplied uh, for a renewal for five years. So that's really an overview of mine. And, and I just want to reiterate, I know that most UL ones are, are, are clinical trial-like projects, but there are UL ones for basic science as well. And that's my overview. And, and, and you, were, you had um, informed me, uh, Dr. Wald, when we were, um, preparing for this uh, in terms of pay line and um, that um, there's money there um, and this may be a potential uh, area where there's not a lot of competition there's less competition per se for this uh, this, uh, this money they're exactly correct um, please don't all apply at once though because <laughs> wait till it's renewed uh, but uh, they do have a lot of money available I will say <clears throat> it has in the past been um, sort of the same group of people continuing to get funded, partly because they this money has to be spent. It's actually um, congressionally mandated. And if they don't have enough applicants to end up funding, um, so they I've heard of them funding projects that scored at the 60th percentile. Um, there are, so part of the requirement for these grants is that you must um, make your data, of course, publicly accessible, but also all the clinical data um, collected on the first responders is located in a public, um, in a public repository. And so for clinicians, this would be a perfect way to become involved because all of the first responders 
that are still with us today are seen in the same clinic um, in New York and all that, that data is accessible. Thank you. We have another question. In terms of a budget for U01, is there a specific budget range per year? What is the average amount of money per year for these grants? I'll just reiterate for mine, it was uh, the max was 600,000 direct uh, per year. And uh, I, I don't know, and Dr. Conwell can comment on the clinical project, but that um, 600,000 direct per year is pretty big for a, a basic science. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's around 500,000 or less, but um, now our UO1s that we have, you know, our budgets, you know, the, the award is under 400,000. Um, so I think it's going to be 500,000 uh, or less. Yeah, I'll just add a little bit. On the UO1s, there aren't really parent announcements per se. So those are going to vary depending on the RFA as far as the, the amount. Um, some of them are gonna be four or 500 or less. I've seen some that have been, you know, 600,000 or more a year. So that's just gonna depend on the specific program announcement that you're applying to. The ones, the ones I've, I've had are, are, are not, they, it, it appears to be, I know we talked about this internally, it appears to be a way of getting a lot done for um, a little bit of money. <laughs> especially the clinical uh, UO ones. So we, we really are working very, very hard. Um, there's not a, lot of, not a lot of funding. Sometimes you wish there was more funding uh, for it. Okay, next slide. So I'm gonna just, I'm gonna talk, we have two uh, UO ones um, from the NIDK. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just talk about the first one called the Ohio State University Chronic Pancreatitis uh, Diabetes and Pancreas uh, Cancer Clinical Center. And uh, myself and uh, Phil Hart are the um, are the MPIs uh, on this um, uh, UO one. We now are in year seven, so we did get um, renewed uh, for a second uh, five years. The second um, UO one, Dr. Uh, George Pepper Christow is the content PI, and myself and Phil Hart are also MPIs uh, on this. So let's talk about the uh, CPDPC. The, the CPDPC is a um, really looks at the interaction between chronic pancreatitis, diabetes, and uh, pancreas cancer. There was an announcement uh, that was sent out, sent out to study um, this relationship. Um, we uh, contacted the uh, PO uh, very early. Um, I actually was told that we sent the very first uh, letter of intent. From Ohio, it came from Ohio State uh, for this, um, for this uh, UO1. And uh, we assembled a group of collaborators, which we will talk about. I have about four or five slides I will uh, show you. Uh, next slide. So this is uh, not really meant for you to read all this, but this is part of the hypothesis and specific aims page uh, from the Ohio State uh, Clinical Center. That's Phil Hart in the uh, upper right and myself. Um, so the, the, it's the hypothesis and, and specific aims page, how, how it's laid out in our research proposal. Uh, number one was to look at what we call this, uh, called the biochip OSU biomarker in chronic pancreatitis. So we wanted to look at the pancreas fluid, blood, and urine to come up with uh, biomarkers for a diagnosis of uh, chronic uh, pancreatitis. And we assembled what we call the pancreas uh, disorders network. And we'll tell you more about this, but uh, a large network of um, uh, academic medical centers throughout uh, the country. Um, next slide. The second um, project that we proposed was to, called the peptide study, was to look at uh, pancreatic polypeptide response to a mixed meal for a diagnosis of what we call type 3C diabetes. So there's, we, we're all very familiar with type 1 diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes, but there's another type of diabetes that occurs uh, in relationship to uh, chronic pancreatitis and pancreas cancer. Um, that, um, for lack of a better uh, terminology, has been called type 3C um, diabetes. And so trying to make that diagnosis is challenging. And it's been shown that a blunted uh, uh, pancreatic polypeptide response after a mixed meal may help um, differentiate that from type 2 diabetes uh, in the adults. So we proposed uh, a project based on some of Dr. Hart's um, uh, data when he was a medical pancreatology fellow at um, uh, Mayo Clinic. So we proposed 
these two um, studies uh, to be considered for our entry into the um, CBDPC uh, consortium as a uh, clinical uh, center. Next slide. So one of the things I, um, we want to show you and emphasize to so all of you clinical uh, investigators and translational investigators of the resources that are available to you from the CCTS. Now this, I put this grant together, Dr. Hart and I put this grant together back in 2014. Uh, and, at that, that, and at that time, so this is actually, this actually comes from our grant there are a lot of resources. There are regional and networks. At that time, the Ohio Clinical Trials Collaborative uh, was available with a lot of other um, Ohio academic medical centers to tap into resources. There was the Appalachian uh, Translational Research Network, uh, which is still active. You can tap into it for uh, accessing patients. The Midwest Area Research Consortium for Health called March. Also, the Strategic Pharma Academic Research Consortium for Translational Medicine called SPARC. And of course, our CCTS is part of the, uh, it is a CTSA, which allows you to leverage a lot from the, uh, the NIH. So one thing that you need to be aware of, there's a lot of resources that are available to you. You have to go over, go over to the CCTS, knock on the doors and start uh, talking to uh, people and, and get information on what is available for you as a clinician and as a physician scientist who wants to uh, participate in these collaborative uh, networks, there's a lot that you can use to uh, really um, uh, uh, have a strong application uh, for, these, uh, for these grants. And this, is, this comes directly out of our application. Uh, next slide. The other thing that you have here in uh, Columbus is the Appalachian region. So the Ohio, Kentucky, and West Virginia region. We, we, as you know, we have a lot of patients that come to us from Appalachia. And in regard to pancreatitis, we felt that the obesity and diabetes, excessive alcohol, cigarette smoking, in terms of the national rankings for West Virginia, Kentucky, and Ohio, we felt that we could leverage this uh, and make a strong case for our entry into uh, the consortium. And this is uh, also comes from our grant uh, application um, that we um, proposed. We also, you see down at the bottom, we, have, we also had a very strong letter from um, Dr. Jackson uh, to support our application. And this really, really helps. She's um, known um, all over the world, but you know, definitely at the NIH, she's got like, the largest um, uh, NIH grant uh, ever funded there. So they, they know her very well. And our CCTS is uh, very, very uh, strong. Next um, slide. So I did want to show you in a little more detail of what we what we put together. So we actually submitted essentially a consortium within the consortium. So we uh, look, we actually called our friends around the country, um, and we looked at eight uh, academic medical centers, in, in, including Ohio State, but Mayo Clinic, Chicago, Massachusetts, Brigham and Women's, University of Minnesota, Columbia, and UPMC, and also three. Uh, pediatric centers nationwide, Cincinnati and Boston, and we felt that we could um, leverage this um, to be able to recruit um, enough patients to uh, have a strong application. And this network of research uh, medical centers uh, evaluates over 2,000 chronic pancreatitis patients per year and performs over 6,000 EUS procedures per year. So we felt that that would make us um, uh, give us a strong application. Next uh, slide. The other thing that um, we thought was very important is that we wanted to, uh, whatever uh, research that we, um, that we produce, we want it to be um, applicable to the general US population. So if you look at where these academic medical centers are in terms of Columbus and Rochester, Chicago, Boston, Pittsburgh, Minneapolis, Cincinnati, and you summarize the means of, of, the, um, of the gender distribution, the uh, ethnic distribution, um, uh, household uh, incomes, uh, we got pretty close to the uh, U.S. population demographics, and that was part of the goals, is that whatever we produce, it can uh, lead the academic medical centers and be applied to the general uh, population, so we tried to make sure we, uh, we did that. Next slide. So that was the, um, that was our um, grant um, application. So I think there's three more questions. Um, 
more questions. So let's open up the questions, and take a look at those. Sure. So when you say contact CCTS, I'm not really sure where they are physically located. Yes. And with COVID restrictions, who should I reach out to? Yeah, so, so, so prior to COVID, I, I'll tell you what I did. I mean, I, you know, I was a new faculty here. I, I, I had just arrived in October 2013. I talked to my chair, Dr. Griever, and he told me it's over in prior, um, you know, prior library. I went over there and went upstairs on the elevator and just started knocking on the doors and started talking to uh, people and, and made a lot of um, contacts and just asked what resources are available for me to help me put together uh, this U01 grant. And I, I got a lot of help. Just got tons of help. Um, now, now that we have COVID, uh, Angela, I mean, what, what, what should be done? So there is, on our website, we do have um, links where you can go in and request different services. And um, we have people who are monitoring those requests and will reach out to you. Um, I myself am always a resource, along with our administrative director of the CCTS, Tiffany Bernard. Um, could, but really reaching out to anyone at the CCTS, we can get you in the right hands. But I would say going for, for these large um, uh, pro like proposal development and, and other grants, I would probably be the best contact the CCTS. Um, another question, is there, sorry, my screen is moving. Is there an optimal number of centers for a U01 grant? And also does geography matter with different methods to recruit, including direct patient domain for recruitment with geographic location centers matter? Dr. Wall, any uh, comments on that one? I, I don't think there's an optimal number. This would be a great question for a PO. Um, but I think that definitely geography should come into play. Um, as well as, um, ge or, uh, I would say, re patient representation uh, um, when doing a, a clinical project. The beauty of basic science is we don't have to worry about that with our mice. Um, but I think that that definitely should be discussed with the PO. And I'll also just jump on the next um, question that Dr. Moss has is how are these grants viewed in terms of early career faculty promotion and tenure, I think they're viewed very highly. I think that a U01, you know, is absolutely equivalent to an R01, if not seen in a more superior light. Yeah, I, I agree. These are equivalent to an R01, if not even um, stronger in terms of the, the amount of work that you have to do. And, you know, actually there are, several, there are multiple R01s that spin off of a U01 collaborative, uh, collaborative uh, grant. Um, Yes, so I, I can tell you in our U01, we are um, facing the challenges of COVID and being creative with our recruitment uh, strategies because of COVID and patients not being able to come in for follow up because of uh, exposure. Um, the other thing we are, are challenged with is making sure we have representation um, of different uh, racial and ethnic groups. And we are now uh, thinking of putting together a specific, um, a specific ancillary study to target um, populations that are not represented in our um, in our studies, despite working very hard to try to have a balanced um, consortium around the country, we still are we still have groups that are not represented well. So we might have to try and, and fix that. So th so those are the challenges that you have because because we want the studies to ultimately be a widely applicable uh, to the U.S. Uh, population at large. So there's some questions here, uh, just uh, taking a deep dive. In preparing the U01 grant application, can you speak to the process of, you know, timeline development, proposal development, figures and tables, um, refining the surveillance page, securing key letters of support, and pre-submission peer review, and grants checklist. So I think this really, uh, in terms of time and figures and all this letters of support, I think this really leads us into uh, Diana, who has been uh, a godsend for me on all my UO1s, R01s that I've sent in, and she helps me tremendously with the timeline. Um, Diana, you wanna um, walk us through what you provide uh, for us. Once you see this, you're gonna be very, very happy. Uh, she keeps it all together for you. Sure. Um, so yeah, whenever, I would just like Next to slide. emphasize, contact the GMO as soon as you know you're planning to, to submit a U01. Um, the earlier, the better. 
include us in like every step of the way um, that way. And there'll be some more general, the checklist here is very, very specific, but then I've got some other slides that have more generalized deadlines, but um, you see on here, as far as just the actual documents go, we like to have bio sketches um, at least a couple weeks ahead because we normally look through all of the bio sketches and make sure they are formatted correctly. Um, and if we have to reformat or send them back to have changes done, then we need we need the extra time for those. Um, can, for any consortium subcontracts that you've got on there, we need to have those. Um, there are different deadlines if it's a more basic, like 10 or less subs. Um, and then there are different deadlines if you've got like multiple projects and more than 10 subs. So we'll go over that in a minute. Um, but yeah, the consortium, if you can get us the, the subs and contact names at least five weeks before the deadline day, we have to then send out sub requests to all the the other institutions um, and they need time to process all their paperwork. Some of them have two week requirements with their institutions to get things signed. So we like to get those out as early as possible so that we can get everything back into us at least 10 days before the applications do because then we've got to incorporate all of their information into the budget and the application. So um, the consortiums, I would, I would say get that information to us as early as you can and at a minimum five, five weeks in advance. Um, then about a week and a half is when we're gonna want all of your administrative information, like the, the project narrative, the summary, all of those kind of equipment, like the documents that you can probably put together a little bit easier because you've probably used them for R01s and different things. Um, and then the next, if you want to go down to the next slide, when you're, we're looking at the, yeah, so the human subject stuff, we would want all of that stuff at that point in time as well. Um, any animal research, those kind of attachments. And then the last thing that we give you a little more time to work on is the science. Um, and we want those it would help to have them at least a week before because we, once we get everything, we review it. The earlier you get it to us, the better review we can do. Um, and then we get everything uploaded to the application, send it back to you so you can review it and make any changes, send any changes. So if we're doing everything last minute, we don't have time to do all that stuff. We don't have time to look at it. You don't have time to make the changes. And then once I'm done with it, I still have to send it to the Office of Sponsored Programs and they take another look at it. And sometimes they see stuff that, that we don't that needs to be changed. So um, getting us everything in time for us to get it put together at least three days before the deadline for you to review and OSP to review, um, I would say would be critical. And then on the next two slides, you can see we've divided some of these deadlines and I can always send you these um, if you need, you can, cause we've got it set to where you can put the, the deadline in up there and then it'll give you these, these dates down here. So if you're doing just a standard application, um, you don't have a lot of projects, you've got 10 subs or less, these are the general, the general deadlines. Um, so notify us at least six weeks prior, I would suggest on the use. When you contact your program officer 12 weeks at, in advance, um, I would suggest including us at that point and, and letting us know so that we can, we can start working with you. And then again, the five weeks prior for the sub awards, 10 business days for this, we want all the sub documents back, seven business days for the admin stuff, three days prior for the science. Um, and then we like to say one day before, have everything done and finalized with no changes so we can send it to OSP. Um, if 
for some reason we miss something and we submit and there are errors that need to be fixed, if you do that the day of, you don't have time to fix those. If you're submitting it at five o'clock and it's due at five o'clock, you're pretty much out of luck being able to fix any, any errors that, that might come back. Hopefully there won't be any, but it does happen. So, so as the earlier we can get it submitted is, is gonna be better, more advantageous for, it, for you as the PI. And then on the next slide, you can see for the larger, more complex applications, if you're gonna do a multi-project, um, if you've got subs, more than 10 subs, we do want that three week, three month prior notification. Um, nine weeks prior is when we want all the information to get the sub requests out because we want to get more, those subs back six weeks prior if possible um, so that we can get all, all those put into the budget and, and work with that like we need to. And then you can just see everything's moved up for the more complex applications. So yeah, I would, I would just, Again, emphasize working with us along the way, keep us involved, let us know what you're doing. Um, I wouldn't, I always tell my PIs to send me stuff as you get them finalized. Don't wait until the end and send all the documents at once. Um, Cause we normally have your Kai use, which is where we do the applications set up and ready so that when we get any kind of documents in, we can upload them. Um, that way we're not doing, doing it all at once and we can get things turned around and back to you at a, a little bit easier. Um, so that's, that's pretty much from our point of, our point of view, the, de the deadlines. Thank you, Diana, very informative. All right, but thank you very much. I mean, the grants office is awesome. I mean, having that checklist and have that with you, you can just start going through that and hitting those deadlines. You'll get your application in on time. It just really um, keeps you organized. Very informative and very helpful. Do we have any other questions in the Q and A in the chat? Uh, I will add on the on the checklist. Normally, what we do with the use because they're more specific. Um, this checklist on here is very generic. So I'll go through the URFA, the specific one that you're applying to and make notes in that checklist of anything specific and highlight it that you need to be aware of um, as far as specific information they might want in the research strategy or, or whatever. So it'll be a little more specific to each, each program announcement. Great. I think we have a something in the chat and something in the Q&A, I think we have a question. Uh, yes, so I see, would the CCTS help for initial application for a U01 application for pharma funding as an investigator initiated study? To that, I would say yes, we definitely would help. Um, just reach out, contact us, that is uh, definitely a service we provide. Q and A. There's something. Oh. Uh, in Q and A, they may have an MOU to provide investigational product if a clinical trial IND. Right. Is that? Oh, sorry. Um, the question. I think can industry be a partner in the U01 application for NIH? Industry um, may agree to sponsor some. I, um, I see that some of those are uh, maybe small business grants. Um, I um, can help. Maybe that's the route to go. I, I do know that um, in our U01, um, they do allow industry to help um, pay for things and, and, and to help you for sure. I mean, we've got um, we have a, a one drug company that's helping the whole consortium and lowering the cost of drug and. Providing, providing things. We've got um, one lab that's actually giving us a reduced rate on um, the lab fee. This is a commercial lab. Uh, so um, there are partnerships on these NIH uh, studies. It's, it's needed. I mean, there's just only so much money uh, out there. Well, 
Well, definitely please feel free to put some more questions in the chat or Q&A. Um, I did just want to um, put up here the save the dates for the upcoming three sessions. Um, and I don't see any other questions, but yeah, please feel free to put forth questions. Excellent, excellent. I just want to say thank you to um, Dr. Wall. Thank you, uh, Diana. Uh, of course, thank you to Angela, who's a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, MC and hostess here. She's keeping us all uh, in line. She makes all these beautiful slides and gets all these announcements out to us and keeps us on task. But we've got three more of these sessions to go. These are being recorded. We want you to, uh, to use these as a resource. Um, we just are, are excited to bring these uh, to you. We've had some success here getting these UL1 grants at Ohio State. Dr. Jackson wants us to be even more engaged in these uh, grant mechanisms. They're there for us. We've got valuable resources here at Ohio State for you to tap into and utilize this. We have a very a large and successful CCTS that's here for you to use these resources and be successful in um, being awarded uh, these UL1 um, grants. So uh, from my standpoint, uh, thank you all uh, very much. And we look forward to you um, signing on to these other um, three uh, sessions. <laughs>